In an unprecedented news conference today, the spouse of a jailed CIA whistleblower is speaking out. Holly Sterling, the wife of imprisoned former CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling, will appear at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. Sterling is serving a three-and-a-half-year sentence for leaking classified information to New York Times reporter James Risen about a failed U.S. effort to undermine Iran's nuclear program. Risen later exposed how the risky operation could have actually aided the Iranian nuclear program. In January, Sterling was convicted of nine felony counts, including espionage. His case was the subject of the documentary short, The Invisible Man. Here's a clip. They already had the machine geared up against me. The moment that they felt there was a leak, every finger pointed to Jeffrey Sterling. The, the word retaliation is not thought of when anyone looks at the experience that I've had with the agency, then I just think you're not looking. That's a clip from The Invisible Man, produced by Norman Solomon of ExposeFacts.org and Judith Ehrlich, who directed The Most Dangerous Man in America, Daniel Ellsberg, in the Pentagon Papers. Well, we're joined right now in Washington, D.C., by the wife of Jeffrey Sterling, Holly Sterling, who will be speaking at the National Press Club after she leaves this broadcast. Also with us is Norman Solomon, longtime activist, executive director of the Institute for Public Accuracy, co-founder of RootsAction.org, and co coordinator of ExposeFacts.org. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Uh, we want to start with Holly Sterling. Can you talk about what you will be saying at the National Press Club today? What happened to your husband? Why is he in jail? And what are you demanding? Um, Jeffrey um, is in prison currently right now because he was convicted um, of espionage. Um, the press conference today is um, to um, make people aware of what has happened. But most importantly, I have written a letter to President Obama asking for the immediate pardon of Jeffrey. And Norm Solomon, can you explain, for people who aren't that familiar with Jeffrey Sterling's case, why is it significant and uh, what kind of precedent might it set? Well, the case is significant for civil liberties and for freedom of the press and, really, the public's right to know with informed consent in what's supposed to be a democracy. The uh, challenge is for people to recognize that, at many levels, the Obama administration is continuing to wage an enormous war on whistleblowing and investigative journalism. Uh, in tandem with uh, the tightening even further uh, through technology and political choice of the surveillance state and continued warfare around the planet, as we've heard again uh, in the news today, in terms of uh, a warfare state. So the precedents uh, are chilling in many respects. And uh, a few of them briefly include that Jeffrey Sterling was convicted on the basis entirely of circumstantial evidence. The government presented a mosaic of supposedly incriminating information that involved entirely legal activities uh, by Jeffrey Sterling. And it should be uh, made clear that uh, Jeffrey is a whistleblower because, through legal channels, he went to the Senate Intelligence Committee as a former CIA case officer to give information about a botched and dangerous CIA operation involving nuclear weapon design uh, transmittal to Iran. So the precedents are very dangerous because in a real sense, they're uh, warning shots across the bow, not only for journalists and potential whistleblowers, but for any government official who even legally uh, goes through channels to provide uh, concerns and information to appropriate officials, who legally speaks to journalists. What happened to Jeffrey Sterling was, in the trial itself, those legal activities were turned against him and used as circumstantial evidence toward conviction. I want to turn to a clip from The Invisible Man, your documentary about Jeffrey Sterling's case. Um, this is a clip. I reached out to the Senate Intelligence Committee. I gave them my concerns about an operation I was involved in, and I thought it could have an impact a negative impact on our soldiers going into Iraq. Operation Merlin 
it was a cockamamie harebrained scheme developed by covert action operators who had lots of money. The Senate Intelligence Committee and the House Committee, they have clearances to hear this. That is what they are there for. They are there for oversight. They are not oversight committees. They are overlook committees. Before reporting Operation Merlin to the Congress, Sterling had sued the CIA for racial discrimination. Sterling became the first African-American case officer to sue the CIA for racial discrimination. He claimed a pattern of prejudice derailed his career. Shortly after 9-11, I felt anger, anger to the point you know, I want to do something about this. I will drop my discrimination claims. I want to come back and help. The response I got at that offer of dropping my suit was, you're fired. John Brennan, the uh, head of the CIA at the moment, he personally came down to the administrative office to tell me that I was fired. Someone told me, he's like, well, you pulled on Superman's cape. That's now jailed CIA whistleblower Jeffrey Sterling explaining how he first expressed concerns about what the CIA was doing. Um, if you, Norm Solomon, could tell us how was he caught, what, what did the government do, um, and explain exactly how this case relates to the many-year legal struggle of James Risen, the leading New York Times reporter, uh, who himself faced jail for not talking about who his source was. Yes, the government uh, raided the home of uh, Jeffrey Sterling and, and Holly uh, Sterling in 2006, as I recall. Uh, and Holly was hauled before a grand jury and in front of the FBI uh, in the D.C. area. And then for several years, nothing happened. And it wasn't until the Obama administration came in uh, when suddenly Jeffrey, who'd gone back uh, into private employment, uh, an exemplary inspector against insurance fraud, uh, was suddenly uh, indicted and arrested and um, taken into custody. And then there was a dragged out several years while the government attempted to force uh, the excellent New York Times investigative reporter James Risen uh, to essentially rat on his sources uh, for his book, uh, State of War, about the Bush administration. And to his credit, Risen absolutely refused to do that. And so after many years, uh, Jeffrey Sterling was finally uh, taken to trial uh, early this year. Holly Sterling, can you uh, talk about the role of race in your husband's case? Absolutely. Um, well, as you had stated, Jeffrey was the first African-American case officer to file a suit against the CIA. Um, and that, that played a major uh, part in the trial, I believe. Um, you know, Jeffrey had upset the CIA, and um, because of that, um, they went after him as uh, really the only source, um, um, potential source, for Mr. James Risen's book. Um, no, and no. so, subsequently, um, you know, no one else, no one else was, was um, investigated except Jeffrey. And, Holly, what happened when uh, the authorities came to raid your home? Can you describe the day where you were? Were you at home? Was Jeffrey at home? Um, yes. Actually, I had just gotten home from testifying at the grand jury. Um, and Jeffrey and I were home. Approximately 20 minutes after arriving home, my lawyer called to tell me that the FBI was on their way, um, because they did have a search warrant. Um, and I'd like to note out that. My lawyer said that this never happens. He's never had, in the history of him being a criminal lawyer, the FBI calling to, to alert him that his client's home is going to be raided. Um, he said that means they have nothing on Jeffrey. So, um, approximately about 10 minutes later after that phone call, um, there was a knock at the door, and about um, 15 agents surrounded our home, came in. They went methodically through our home. Um, they were very polite. They asked, is, um, you know, is this the room where you said you had a computer, um, took everything out, wearing gloves, um, putting things in brown paper bags, um, 
you know, and went through, put everything back. Um, at one point, um, one of the agents went over to Jeffrey and showed him a subpoena for his uh, work laptop. And um, the agent went to take Jeffrey's um, actual suitcase that, that um, had the laptop in it. And um, many people may not know, but Jeffrey um, was a licensed lawyer before he was convicted and read the subpoena and said, um, it does not include the contents of the bag, it only includes the laptop, and so took out the laptop and gave that to the agent. Hmm. Norman Solomon, could you explain what uh, President Obama could do now? What's in his executive power to do on Sterling's case? Uh, President Obama has the power to respond to Holly Sterling's letter today by issuing an immediate pardon. Uh, for Jeffrey Sterling and getting him out of prison, where he's been now for four months and is scheduled not for release until the middle of the year 2018. Uh, so the president could halt this, really, uh, persecution, I would say, of Jeffrey Sterling that's been going on for uh, more than a decade when you trace back the origins of what ordeal he and Holly Sterling uh, have gone through. And, Holly Sterling, why have you decided to do this now? You're the first spouse of a CIA whistleblower in prison now to hold a news conference and speak out. Um, well, as Norman had stated, this has been going on for over a decade. And, um, unfortunately, um, Jeffrey really was—did um, not get any press coverage during this, it actually somewhat became the Ryzen case. Um, and he's been done a great injustice. He's completely innocent. Um, they had absolutely no um, evidence to state that Jeffrey had done this. Um, Special Agent Ashley Hunt, on cross-examine, stated that fact, that there was absolutely um, no email records, no phone call records, no one had witnessed the two being together, exchanging classified information. Um, in fact, she said that she speculated that Jeffrey was the source. Um, so he has been wrongly convicted, and um, I just think that, um, you know, he, need, he needs to be pardoned, that this was a grave injustice, and um, he does not need to be in prison for the next three and a half years. Can you tell us also I, I, where exactly he's imprisoned and how often you've been able to visit him and what the process is for you to see him, your husband? He actually um, is in Colorado. Um, during the sentencing hearing, um, the judge had stated that he should be placed nearest to our home. Um, we live in St. Louis, Missouri. Colorado, obviously, is not near our home. It's approximately 900 miles away. Um, I had to get permission to see Jeffrey. And um, I have been able to see him three times, once a month, since he's gone in. Um, it is extremely costly for me to go there, flight, airfare, um, excuse me, hotel, rental car. Um, we get to visit approximately six hours a day on Saturday and Sunday. Um, we sit in a room. We are able to sit next to one another. Um, but. The unfortunate thing is that Jeffrey is um, demoralized when I visit by having to go through a strip search before and after our visit. Jessalyn Radak of the Government Accountability Project wrote a piece for Salon.com in May called The Shocking Court Case That Proves the Government's Shameful Petraeus Hypocrisy. In it, she asks why former CIA officer Jeffrey Sterling faced two decades in prison, while former CIA Director General David Petraeus got two years probation for similar charges. Radak writes, quote, Petraeus, who gave a far greater volume of classified and potentially harmful information to his mistress, was given a sweetheart plea deal and was never charged with anything. Conveniently, his sweetheart plea deal was to a misdemeanor, not under the Espionage Act. Similarly, former CIA directors Leon Panetta and John Brennan, both of whom disclosed the identities of undercover operatives, were never charged. Norm Solomon, can you talk about this difference in how um, people are treated. This entire episode, uh, which continues with Jeffrey Sterling, is part of a huge pattern of selective uh, prosecution, in the case of Leon Panetta, selective sentencing in terms of 
uh, General David Petraeus, and it shows how the entire judicial and uh, executive branch process in terms of uh, assessing and prosecuting uh, classified uh, leaks is just riddled with pollution and poisoned by uh, political power. Uh, this administration, uh, worse than any other in memory in this regard, has totally turned the prosecution of leaks into a politicized set of vendettas. And I think it's necessary, it's e essential, that we recognize that there is no equality or near equality or justice under the law in this regard. I should add that Jeffrey Sterling was convicted on the basis of metadata, which totally undermines the claims of this administration and its defenders in terms of surveillance, that metadata is not an intrusion. In point of fact, it's part of a speculative process where uh, the government is able to inject and project into the proceedings its own assumptions and fantasies about what the metadata actually indicates in terms of content that's not provided. And I, I should add that uh, the news conference today featuring uh, Holly Sterling not only is co-sponsored by RootsAction.org and ExposedFacts.org as part of the Institute for Public Accuracy, where I work, but very significantly, leadership has been taken by Reporters Without Borders. And this is very important because we need, and it is essential, for journalistic organizations to recognize and fight for the rights of whistleblowers, which are totally intertwined with the rights of an independent and free press. And I have to say that uh, the good news, bad news, good news is that Reporters Without Borders is a conspicuous organization by forthrightly challenging uh, this very oppressive treatment of Jeffrey Sterling. We need many other journalistic organizations to step to the fore and begin to show some courage, which has been lacking from them.